The History of Recreational Diving by Dr. Franz Cronier. Man has always held a fascination for the beauty and mystery of the sea. Fired by a desire to embrace its charm and challenge its fury, we engage in various pursuits from sailing its surface to delving its depths. The latter, diving, has a special appeal to all of us. Its history is a remarkable tale of the triumph of human ingenuity over environmental adversity, a battle against all odds. And so it is that the history of diving features three collections of people. Those who captured the imagination of mankind and kindled our desire to enter the sea. Those who invented the equipment and diving techniques to overcome the many physiological and physical barriers. And those who bravely and often foolishly applied these ideas and methods to pave the way to what is now called recreational diving. The word scuba has fairly recent origins. The acronym Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus started as military jargon coined by the US Navy Underwater Demolition Team. As used today, the term scuba distinguishes self-contained devices from surface supply diving, diving habitats, hard hat diving and one atmosphere submersible vessels and containers. The origins of diving are lost in antiquity. The first record is actually found in the Persian epic of Gilgamesh dating back to 3000 before Common Era. Here description is given of how the hero retrieves oysters to restore lost youth to a man. The next chronological reference is to a Greek sponge diver Glaucus, who apart from his successful sponge diving exploits, also has the dubious honor of drowning. Rather than admitting this rather humiliating truth, his peers elevate him to the status of a god. Ancient Persian friezes, dated around 865 before Common Era, depict men swimming with some sort of breathing bag, either for flotation or perhaps the first primitive breathing apparatus. By 600 before Common Era, sponge diving had become a very important industry in early Greece, and this is depicted on a lot of the ceramic art of that time. Two of these early Greek divers were a father and daughter team, Silius and Sayama. Employed by King Xerxes of Persia, they assisted with the recovery of goods from sunken ships. Unfortunately for the king, he refused to allow them to return after many years of loyal service, so they retaliated by cutting the anchor lines during a storm and destroyed his navy. In the 1500s, Leonardo da Vinci drafted various diving contraptions, including the first known scuba equipment. It was captured in his Codex Atlanticus. Da Vinci's design combined air supply and buoyancy control in a single system. It foreshadowed later diving suits. There's no evidence that he ever built the device, although modern reconstructions can be seen here. He himself, having abandoned scuba in favor of refining the diving bell, which offered both protection and endurance in the era preceding compressed air. In 1622, a Spanish treasure fleet on its way home was scattered and largely destroyed by a hurricane near the Florida Keys. The Spaniards salvaged a small part of the treasure with a custom-built diving bell, but most was never recovered. Storms continued harassing the treasure transport between 1715 and 1733, with hundreds of people drowning. The economic losses intensified Spain's national deficit and accelerated its decline as a world power. The lure of sunken treasure remained an incentive to enter the sea for the next 350 years, although the search rendered more people poor than it did rich. The change from bells to whistles, if you like, came when a German physicist, engineer and natural philosopher, Otto von Gericke, invented the first air pump to study the phenomenon of vacuum and the role of air in combustion and respiration. His invention also, for the first time, allowed air and gas to be pumped to pressures greater than one atmosphere, either to supply a dive underwater or for storage as compressed gas. However, in the absence of materials to contain compressed gas, efforts continued to provide a continuous supply of gas to the diver at depth. However, in 1680, an Italian physician, Giovanni Borelli, imagined a close-circuit rebreather. His drawings show a giant bag using chemical components to regenerate the exhaled air. 
This, he suggested, should allow the air to be breathed again by a submerged diver. Borelli also drew rather bizarre claw-like feet on his diver, which some suggested may have been the first renditions of swim fins and the metamorphosis to becoming frogmen. In 1808, Friedrich von Drieberg developed a device he called the Triton. The system used an air reservoir worn by the diver, but because it could not contain sufficient pressure to provide enough duration, it still had to be supplied by surface hoses. The diver could obtain air from the backpack reservoir through a valve operated by nodding his head forward. Then in 1819, two brothers, Charles and John Dean, employed as merchant seamen, designed a smoke helmet to fight fires in ships. Although the original concept failed, the invention became the blueprint of the most successful diving system to date, the hard hat or standard dress. Without the capital or manufacturing skills, they approached their employer, who eventually contracted a German coppersmith and inventor in London, Augustus Seabee. After producing the first smoke helmet, Seabee's interests turned to diving. By 1836, he had introduced the concept of closed dress, that is, sealing the helmet to the suit to prevent flooding. So successful was his system that it was used in the salvage of the Royal George in 1839 from the harbour at Spithead, England. This won CB the endorsement of Her Majesty's Royal Navy and established his firm, CB and later CB Gorman and Company, as the leading manufacturer of diving equipment in the world. Many parallel efforts were underway as materials and artisan skills started to better support man's dream to enter the sea. In 1825, an Englishman, William James, developed what several historians considered to be the first true scuba. It employed tanks of compressed air and a full diving dress with a helmet. Limits on useful depth and duration kept it from widespread adoption by commercial divers, who eventually favoured Seabee's standard dress. Then in 1864, two Frenchmen, Benoit Recarol and Auguste Denerouze, developed the first demand valve. The diver carried a tank on the back, fed from the surface, from which the diver could obtain air through an ambient pressure compensating, membrane-controlled demand valve. The diver was able to breathe with minimal effort, and their system of surface pump, pressurized air cylinder and demand regulators went into commercial production in 1867. This was the first recorded respirator controlled demand valve in history and is similar to the one used in modern scuba. Jules Verne added intrigue to the quest for depth in 20,000 leagues under the sea. In 1869 he had Captain Nemo, his crew, using the Rockerol Denaru system with the next inevitable development, independence from the surface. The building of the Brooklyn Bridge in New York introduced Caisson's disease or the Benz for the first time. These clinical labels for the misfortune of human effervescence following prolonged exposure to compressed air were eventually transferred to the field of diving when diving systems were able to offer a combination of depth and duration that was able to cause this phenomenon. This was to remain one of the primary occupational hazards to divers for the next 25 years.